Hello everyone, my name is Darwin. I'm a senior solutions architect here at GitLab. And today I wanna to walk you through which of the many GitLab installation methods should you use. Now, just a quick uh, peek at what our GitLab installation methods are. There are many, and that's why we wanna kinda of take you through this. Um, we have uh, various different Linux uh, distros that you can deploy on, uh, even Raspberry Pi. Uh, we deploy on Kubernetes, and that's one of the biggest uh, differentiators. We can support to all the major clouds, uh, support Docker directly. If you wanna get nitty gritty, you can install from source. And then the community has a bunch of ways that they've prepared GitLab that we also uh, point you to if those are the kind of installation methods that you would uh, need to employ. I wanna take a little minute to talk about why I like this topic. So before I came to GitLab, I worked at a, in a cloud transformation developer enablement group for a company with about 4,500 developers with 100 stacks. And cloud transformation meant that we were helping them to lift into the cloud and then eventually also go to multi-tenant automation with software that had a variety of ages. And so that group, we had to also make sure that everything that the, was lifted and shifted and then turned to multi-tenant in this way was production grade SaaS engineered. And so because of that, any tooling that we either built internally or provided as a service, we also wanted it to be production grade. And that drove a few things. Uh, for instance, in order for GitLab to be taken as a serious production grade service that they can rely on, they would need to be itself capable of supporting what the customers were requesting of those stacks. So if those SaaS stacks were five nines, then the tooling required to patch them, upgrade them, deploy them, needed to also support that level of reliability. So in that regard, we built it on AWS ECS as a Docker cluster with RDS and Elastic Cache and CloudFront as far as uh, platform as a service services. We also updated GitLab every month, so we didn't want to fall behind on the value that's in that GitLab continuous release system. In addition, we ran all upgrades through an integration environment before they hit the production environment so we could see, observe, and understand what was expected to happen. And finally, we had a DevOps procedure in order to understand when to adopt a GitLab release. So we wouldn't simply grab the release that was two months older or two months newer than us or a month newer. We would actually decide which specific release to calibrate, whether we wanted to skip one or drop back or move forward based on an analysis procedure of all the GitLab metadata about releases that's up on the website. So I like this topic because I've dug into it pretty deeply in a production situation, and I wanted to give you some advice that stems from that experience. So as we mature our DevOps tooling, a lot of times we have customers come to GitLab and they have a situation that's very unsustainable in terms of the diversity of tooling that's been knitted together. Now, one of the big problems here is, of course, user experience, users moving between these systems. All the user administration has to deal with all of these systems independently. Users have a multiple user IDs everywhere. So there's some degraded user experience in knitting too many things together. And then there's also a service management. So making each one of these HA and capable of sustaining uh, an HA type of setup uh, is challenging. It's really hard to get that uh, right in terms of service management. As you move forward to consolidate some of these platforms into GitLab as a single solution for more and more of your tool chain, it feels really good to solve that user experience problem. So now users are much more comfortable in the system. You have much more visibility to what's going on in the system because there's one user experience and one user identity across all the tools. But it can be easy also to lose sight of the fact that you aren't uh, actually causing a massive upswing in service management simply by implementing on GitLab. It really matters how you implement GitLab in order to get a production grade experience. So you've got to know what you're building from the get go. And I'd like to draw a little contrast here of production grade tooling versus toys. And what it comes down to is tooling selection is really important. But for tools versus toys, the devil is in the service management details. Now, think of the go-to joke in this area. You know, someone says, hey, we got new CI going. It's rocking the world. It's pushing stuff to all of our clouds. And you're like, awesome. Where, where did they implement that? Well, it's under Larry's desk over there on an old 386 machine that was left lying around from 20 years ago. And everyone has a chuckle. Um, so you can see that uh, even when you move your tooling, say, from that bad of a situation into the cloud, that alone isn't enough to really make it a production grade service. 
And one of the most significant aspects of service management is how GitLab itself is deployed. And so we want to dig into this a little bit deeper. Um, so on the service management front, we have uh, permissions management, very important. Um, effective operations, troubleshooting, and problem resolution is really important. So although it would be great if you stood up GitLab and it never needed anything for the next 20 years, that would be great. But at times, problems do happen. Um, and so when they do happen, you need the skill set to dig in and try to find your way around on those infrastructure technologies that you've deployed GitLab to. You also want to be doing those regular upgrades to keep those feature sets flowing in from the GitLab's uh, release cycle. You also want to be able to continuous, uh, continuously uh, suit your need for operation skilling. So if you have shifts in team members, you want to make sure that the skill set that they need is something that's readily available to you. You also want to consider that you may have taken on more of the DevOps tool chain and therefore more need for production grade. So if you didn't use GitLab before for deployment, but now you are using it for deployment as you move to a, a production grade scenario, your hours of availability expand. So it's important to understand that there's be more pressure on having it up and available more of the time. And then if you go all the way to feature flags, uh, this actually has customer interacting, um, you know, your customer applications are actually interacting with GitLab for some configuration information. And so that's another thing that can broaden your availability and uh, reliability requirements even farther. So keys to service uh, management or kind of the SRE perspective. Um, you can start with GitLab uh, as a single virtual instance. Uh, that's one way to deploy it. It's very efficient this way, and it can service a significant number of users. Um, you can then also uh, do something like a cloud deployment, which is gonna require that you have those cloud skills and the appropriate accounts and information. Then high availability implementations are probably the next level of sophistication. And finally, at the top of the heap, we have the ability to deploy onto uh, Kubernetes. Now, underlying all these installation methods, including the ones we saw on the uh, web page that I was showing you, are two main installation methods. One is what we call Omnibus, which is the main way of installing GitLab is kind of, you know, you, you run it and you install it, or if you grab our containers, we have an Omnibus install inside of there. Um, when you configure with gitlab.rb, that's our Omnibus install. And so it covers most everything in this stack. And then the Kubernetes method, of course, covers uh, some overlapping areas and into Kubernetes itself. Um, so Kubernetes takes over some of the high availability and scalability uh, aspects when you deploy that way. And then if you deploy Omnibus, we have published patterns of how to get high availability built in. So one of the things as you look at this stack, as we go up the stack, we'll find that certain things uh, start to increase or get bigger. And one of them is the smallest sufficient scaling. So the single virtual machine instance, uh, we can use one virtual machine. Uh, we can even have the storage on there, make sure we have rock solid backup and we have a pretty minimal footprint. As we move up, however, that can start to grow. So as soon as you go into high availability implementation, uh, you're looking at several more instances and Kubernetes itself is gonna have a minimum number of instances that are uh, suggested. So for Kubernetes, you're probably going to want to have a minimum of three instances. So the smallest possible scaling of computing cost um, is growing as we move up the stack. In addition, the minimum operation skills. So a single virtual instance, uh, someone with Linux skills and the capability to deploy and manage uh, a Linux platform is going to be pretty comfortable. But as we move up, you're going to need cloud skills and eventually HA skills. And this is also, you're going to need these skills for initial design and deployment of GitLab as well as ongoing uh, maintenance. Uh, minimum cost tends to go up. Uh, minimum operational complexity. So what does it take to start and stop the stack, upgrade the stack? And minimum recovery complexity. So as you go up this stack, your recovery uh, complexity can go up as well, depending on how you choose, uh, make your cho choices in terms of storage. So when we take a, a continuous service management approach, we want to kind of take off our shiny new things hat. Uh, all of us love new tools. Um, we love to look at new ways of doing things. I mean, that's usually one of the reasons people are in IT or software. And we want to move to a continuous service management hat. And so instead of thinking of the latest or the most interesting or the funnest, we try to think of right. So right scaling. Uh, what is the level of scaling that should be uh, pursued for your organization? 
right skilling. Um, so a good example is if you are interested in Kubernetes for your applications, but you haven't made that leap yet, you don't really have any applications running in production in Kubernetes, then deploying GitLab on Kubernetes is actually going to kind of force that issue to the forefront. And you really want to uh, ask yourself if that's the right timing for that. Um, when we looked at the previous slide where we had GitLab at the bottom, GitLab is kind of underlying your ability to deploy to production. So if you make it too innovative at that level, then you can uh, have the situation where you have a, some sort of critical situation with application deployment or availability of the platform, and you're trying to learn Kubernetes as you go in the midst of that. Uh, we also have right infrastructure costing, so the ability to scale down. Um, one question I like to ask folks is, do you know um, how many, what kind of configuration, what's the smallest configuration of GitLab possible that will service a thousand users? And this information is on our website and a web page that I'll show you at the end. Uh, we have patterns for uh, scalability. And the answer is a single virtual instance can do um, a thousand users. And so some people are surprised by that. Um, some of our competitors, actually, we have people come to us from competitors because we can horizontally scale. We have patterns published for up to 50,000 instances. Uh, but sometimes if your needs are less than that, you can lose sight of the fact that there are costs in having that level of scalability at the ready um, at your fingertips. We also at GitLab for our own technologies have a concept known as embracing boring technology. And this is really right around continuous service management. Uh, skilling um, and also availability, troubleshooting, uh, all of these things when we embrace not the bleeding edge technology for our teams, uh, go easier and go better. And then we can skill up on some of those things that are really interesting and intriguing. And as they become more mainstreamed in the market, we can dig in and embrace those. So I'd encourage you to uh, think about that concept of boring technology. You can actually Google it on our website and find it in our handbook, uh, kind of what we uh, try to do with our technology stacks in that regard. Also, all of this is kind of a, a summation of a conventional wisdom, uh, make it as simple as possible, but not simpler. So the way you'd say this for service management is implement the simplest possible way, but not simpler. While we're talking, I want to bust a few GitLab installation myths. So as I interact with customers, people come in and they have certain impressions. And while the impressions are understandable, they may not realize the flexibility that's available in the platform. So they make some assumptions about what, can, what they have to do to get certain benefits. Um, so one of those is sometimes folks think that when they use GitLab SaaS, that they can only use runners that are also SaaS or hosted uh, by GitLab. But in fact, you can take and deploy your own runners uh, on premise in your own data centers and wherever you want in many different places if you want while using GitLab SaaS. So make sure you're not thinking that you have to move to self-hosted GitLab in order to take advantage of self-hosted runners. You also don't need to have GitLab running on Kubernetes to integrate with Kubernetes and have scalable Kubernetes runners. So any GitLab instance, no matter how it is deployed, can interface with the cluster and can even put runners there. So just keep that flexibility in mind when thinking about how to deploy. Also, another thing that uh, can be a challenge is when you're looking at GitLab and you're saying, man, we really think this platform can do what we want, but we want to put together a, a proof that we can do it. And some companies that come to us end up wanting to do a full-on uh, self-hosted implementation that's ready to scale just to get their proof of concept started. But there's really very few things that are different for GitLab.com versus a self-hosted instance. So one way to break uh, some of the schedule pressure here is to break that out and have it so that that proof of concept goes on at GitLab.com while you in parallel uh, handle uh, your self-hosted implementation details and how that might need to look for you. One other detail that's really important is we uh, do not have a migration path from Kubernetes back to the Omnibus installer. We do have a migration path from Omnibus forward to Kubernetes. Um, so if you're at a place with your Kubernetes skilling, and we talk about Kubernetes skilling, you really want to think in terms of the folks who will operate this. So if this is your team, where are you with Kubernetes operations? If this is a, a, another team, some organizations are so big that operationalized technology gets run by an operations-specific team. 
Where's that team with uh, Kubernetes? So with GitLab, if you deploy on Omnibus, we have a way to bring you forward to Kubernetes when your readiness, your operational readiness is uh, in ready for handling Kubernetes. Uh, but we, if you start in Kubernetes, there's not a way to go, oh, you know what, uh, I don't like this, I'd like to go back to Omnibus. So just keep that in mind. You also want to right size your implementation uh, needs according to how many users you have. So this shows that up to a thousand users are easily accommodated by an eight vCPU system with about 30 gigs of memory. Um, we also have many very broadly scaled implementations where there are many, many different instances uh, servicing different layers of the app, uh, the techno of the application. And we'll I'll actually show you uh, in a final slide the link to that. And let's uh, focus a little bit on some Omnibus versus Kubernetes decisions questions. So these are just kind of like some questions to ask yourself about this important uh, part. An enablement team is a team that actually is in charge of providing uh, developer tooling. If you are a tools engineer or a team of tools engineers, then service management is even more critical, especially if people are voluntarily coming to the platform. But even if they aren't, they want to know that what you're building for them is uh, well service managed. Is the team who's going to support GitLab mature in their Kubernetes operation knowledge? Uh, one way to judge that is do they already have at least one Kubernetes stack uh, running in production or productionized where they're having to understand you know, what can go wrong and how to fix problems quickly, how to fix deployment problems? Are you embracing the boring technology concept to maintain a production grade focus? So this is kind of like Agile's de-risk by repeating risky things. This is another one of those kind of top level um, principles that can help guide your whole focus. So uh, embracing boring technology. And then what are your practical day-to-day -day scalability needs? You might be building GitLab for software development teams that are building software on it for applications that just need to scale ridiculously. Um, and that's great. Uh, we love it that the platform can, can help you build that. But what are the actual needs of the GitLab platform itself to scale? It's best if you uh, target those needs when deciding how to build out. So my role as a solutions architect uh, at GitLab, I really enjoy it because I get to help customers figure out questions like these. Um, and so I wanted to just give you a few links here. Uh, the installation methods are all at this URL. The reference architectures, which go all the way up to 50,000 users, are at this URL. If you want to engage with our pre-sales organization, you can get the help of a solutions architect to give you some general guidance, some validation of your implementation plans, and to give you some uh, top level guidance on that. But you should also be aware that we have a full detailed design and turnkey deployment professional services. Um, that allows you to get together, uh, express your objectives as far as how you want this service to work, Professional services will work with you to come up with a design that works best for you cost-wise, operationally, and then actually deploy it to you and hand you the keys. And so this is a really popular option. Uh, a lot of teams right now are uh, struggling with the, they would love to step up to some tooling like this, but they don't actually have time to learn all the GitLab nuances of how to deploy it in a reliable uh, scenario so that it's uh, production ready. And uh, whenever you stand up a service yourself, there's a lot of learning around that and then design and then validation. Um, so it's nice just to have those kind of things done for you. Uh, so if you need to reach out to Solutions Architects or Professional Services, we're happy to help you. I hope that this information does give you some initial guidelines if you're going to tackle this yourself. Thanks a lot for listening, and we hope to see you out there doing more GitLab.